Uh, my name is Ron Bauman, and I want to talk about uh, a common schema, which is a framework uh, for MySQL Server Administration. Um, the talk was actually, uh, the, the project Common Schema is actually created by uh, Shlomi Noor. He's a well-known uh, MySQL uh, community guy. And um, you can find his blog on uh, code.openarc.blog. He's also the creator of the OpenArc toolkit, which you uh, might be using or might know. He couldn't be here, uh, so I offered to, for him to present his uh, project over here. Um, uh, I'm Ronald Bauman. I um, work for Pentaho, but I also contributed a few snippets to Common Schema. So, so um, what's Common Schema? Um, does anybody know what Common Schema is? Anybody used it? See the blogs? Yes. Okay. So it's um, um, well. It, the, the common schema is a is a basically just a database schema full with uh, utilities which might help you with uh, uh, MySQL Server administration. I'm going to cover in this uh, presentation uh, how you can install it, how you can use common schema to do some basic monitoring, uh, how you can use it to inspect the security issues, um, how you can use common schema to look at schema objects and engines and that kind of stuff. Um, common schema comes with a set of utility functions which uh, you might find useful and you can use it to do some scripting which can be very uh, useful if you want to do some uh, database administration tasks. Um, finally, um, common schema is completely open source so you can contribute if you like. So, um, like I mentioned, common schema is a MySQL DBA toolkit and one of the things it, um, um, that distinguishes it from the uh, toolkits that are already in place and already well known is that uh, Common Schema has a self-contained database schema. So all the utilities are inside the database schema. You don't need any uh, external utilities or programming languages. It's simply a matter of uh, running a SQL script and this gives you a schema which contains a, a bunch of tables and views and sort of routines which together form the, the toolkit. It's designed for MySQL 5.1 or higher and it's uh, released under BSD license, so you can pr pretty much do anything you like with it. It's really easy to get a common schema. You can simply download it from the project homepage. So it's, it's on Google Code. Here's the, um, the homepage. So to get it, you simply go to download section and you find the download that's most appropriate for you. There are uh, currently three different uh, distributions. One is uh, simply for any MySQL 5.1 release. Um, if you're running uh, MySQL 5.1 with the InnoDB plugin, you want to uh, download the second one, the schema InnoDB plugin uh, script. And if you're running Procona Server, there's a, there's a separate script that adds a few utilities which are applicable to, uh, to Procona Server. So it's simply a matter of downloading the, the script. And then installation. Um, Oh, yeah, I, I always forgot. The um, Common Schema also comes with a set of um, HTML um, documentation pages. Um, so, the entire toolkit is properly documented, and each utility has its own uh, little documentation page which you can view. There's some uh, things you should you know, read before you start using it, there's some risks involved. Um, but um, yeah, I suggest you take the time to, to read those later on. So, once you downloaded the common schema, it's really easy to install it. You simply open up your MySQL prompt. You have to be logged in as a super user, so usually as root. And, oops. Okay, so, well, I, I already installed mine, but if you would run it, you would simply um, see something like this. Simply uh, run the source command. You will see uh, a number of uh, queries running. And finally, you will get a message that the installation is complete. And you will, have get, a, you, you will uh, get a new uh, database, the common schema. So it's right here. So if we start using the common schema, And look what's inside. You will see a whole bunch of um, whole bunch of tables. One of the first things you want to do is once you install, you can check, you know, some metadata. 
Uh, you can get uh, the version and the license information. You can see what revision you're on. So, like I showed already, there's some tables inside which you can use. And each of those tables uh, are, are documented in the documentation pages I showed before. Um, there's a bunch of routines in there as well. And that is the entire, the entire toolkit. So there's no uh, uh, Perl or uh, downloading Perl packages or whatever. So this pretty much means that you can use the common schema uh, without any plugins uh, and it runs on both Windows and both Linux or whatever environment you're on. The common schema comes with a built-in help. Um, so there's a, a help table if you want to just query for help topics. Um, if you just want to view all topics, you can simply select from that table. And you'll get all the items that you can find help on. So each utility and some keywords that relate to a utility each have their own topic in the help table. And to make things a little bit easier, well, you can Obviously, you can simply select the help page for one particular uh, topic, but you know the output is a little bit messy. Um, but as you can see, uh, Shlomi did a real good job of documenting everything. And to make life easier, there's a there's a little procedure which you can call. So whenever you you want to look up the syntax for a particular utility, you simply uh, run the the help procedure right here. And you punch in the, the name of the utility you're, you're, you want some help on. And you can see the, the documentation uniformly defines the syntax and how you can use it. The description is there, and usually there's some examples there too, which you know, should give you some idea of how you can use this particular uh, utility. Okay. Okay, so. What can you do with Common Schema? Uh, one of the things you can do with it is monitoring. You can use it to monitor, uh, monitor uh, global stat status, um, um, status variables. Um, there's uh, utilities views in there which do not simply uh, get the, the values of the, the status variables, but actually compute a difference uh, in, in a 10 second time interval. So this is a very uh, useful utility for simply quickly monitoring what's going on in your server right now. Um, to make it things even easier, um, Shlomi created a view which um, uh, gets you the difference uh, in case something changed. So you can simply run a uh, query on global status diff non-zero to see all the variables that are changing right now since the last ten, uh, 10 seconds. So if we run this on my system right here, there's not a lot going on, but you can see how it works. So it's going to wait 10 seconds to measure the difference between now and 10 seconds from now. And then the query is going to come back and show you the difference. And it's going to extrapolate the, you know, the, the change in values uh, on a second scale and a minute scale. Obviously for this, this simple run, the extrapolation doesn't mean much. But if you have a busy server and you run the query a couple of times, you can see, you know, you can, you can get a pretty good idea of um, uh, how um, variables are changing right now. And obviously, you can write applications and utilities to uh, graph the output of this of this view. There's also a very high-level view that bunches up the entire process list, so you can see, you know, the total number of processes. And this would give you like the the the, you know, the highest level of overview of what your server is doing right now. A very quick way to see what's going on. And then there is a, another view, another filter on the process list showing you which user is actually doing something. So right now, root is the only one who is doing something. But if you would have more users, uh, you would see for each user, for, for, for each host they're connecting from their activity, which should make it easy to spot uh, particular clients that are giving, you know, giving the database a hard time. There's uh, a couple of other views um, to look into InnoDB um, transactions and logs, um, but I'm, I'm not going to cover those. Right. 
There's a couple of views um, on the grant tables. Um, the privileges for the users of obviously are stored in the MySQL database. But uh, for some purposes, it's hard to see exactly who's been granted which privilege. And uh, you'll find the SQL grants um, view in the common schema, which might, this a might, might make this a little bit easier. So if I run it right now, uh, you can see that um, for every, you know, the, the, in the MySQL database, the grants are separated over a couple of tables. Uh, there's one table for the user privileges, one table for the table privileges, for the column privileges, and so on. And what this view do, does, it, it, it unifies this all into one uh, query, into one view. So you can use the um, privilege level and the privilege level name to, um, you know, to, to use just this one view to get all this information at once. There's a whole bunch of uh, views inside the common schema which uh, allow you to introspect uh, uh, schemas and schema objects. Um, for um, the engine, there's a data size per engine view. If I just run that, we get a whole bunch of information of how much data each engine is, is currently managing. So we see I'm using now three uh, storage engines, CSV, NODB, and MyISM. And for each, we see the number of tables that they are managing, the data size, index size, total size, largest table, and largest size. We have a, a, a similar view on the size per schema. So right now, I'm just introspecting the Sikila schema. And we can see that uh, you know there, there, the number of tables inside there, number of views in there, number of engines that are used in there, um, uh, data size, index size, and all those other other metrics. Yes. These are all views. They don't keep any historical values. That's correct. These are just views. Um, right now, they are written on top of the, either the information schema or the MySQL database. And uh, work is being done right now to cache uh, information from the information schema to make queries on that. Faster. Yeah, it's faster and not so heavy. Yeah. Uh, right now, there are a few views. If you have a busy server with a lot of, you know, a lot of heavy schemas, uh, well, well, you get the obvious, you know, the normal problems you have with the inf information schema. But um, work is being done to to fix that. So that that's actually good news. So. You you should. Read the risks, you know, section in the documentation to, to get a to get a good idea of what, what could go wrong if you use these these things. Basically, uh, it turns out that if you if you don't grab the whole bunch, but you know, look on a per schema basis, you're usually all right. Okay. Um, Yeah, there's also some uh, views. Uh, when you're like uh, playing with a database and you want to convert, you know, from one storage engine to the other, from InnoDB to MyISM, um, you, you know, you might want to go back later on. And there's a few utilities in here that allow you to uh, grab the current, uh, you know, the, the current DDL for those tables, so that's easy to convert back. So, for example, if I run the SQL alter um, statement view. For Sequila, then I will get a bunch of alter statements, which I could now save, and then I could go and mess with the Sequila schema and start converting, you know, from from InnoDB to MyISM or to some other engine, and use the script later on to convert it back to what it was, to whatever it was. In the same vein, um, there is a, a view uh, that allows you to grab the DDL for the foreign keys, because obviously if you have some foreign keys in NNB and you're converting to MySM, oh, then you can use these to, to go back to, to what it was before. Or if you just want to you know, quickly drop a foreign key, you can just grab the, grab the uh, DDL to do that from this, from this view over here. So uh, apart from the table level things, there's also a couple of um, views that allow you to look at columns and column properties. 
So if you use the information schema dot columns uh, uh, table, then there's a lot of columns in there that you usually don't need for you know for a particular purpose. Um, one of the things um, uh, the common schema offers is a quick overview of all the auto increment uh, columns that you're using. So this view uh, makes it really easy to see if you you know if there's a thread that you're running out of uh, auto increment space. So you can in this one view see. Uh, which which auto increment columns are you know having uh, a high a high number, and you can see in the on the ratio that we're you know the ratio com column that we're doing pretty good. There's no 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 of the uh, columns is you know threatening to run out of um, of space, but we could you know use this and notice that for example one of the columns is like hitting the dot nine or dot eight, and you might want to use that information to you know convert from from into big ins or whatever. There are some um, interesting views on keys and indexes. So one of the things I want to focus on is the redundant indexes um, uh, item. So there's always some discussion about what means what, what a redundant index is. Uh, this thing does not give you the you know the final answer, but at least it gives you some some um, some way to quickly spot if there is a problem. So let's well, let me just create this this table over here. So anyone spot the redundant index here? There's one table with two indexes. Both are on ID. So obviously one of them you know is redundant. We don't need it. So we have a common schema dot redundant keys view, which allows us to quickly spot that there's actually uh, an index over here which you know, is redundant and it's redundant because there's already an existing index which covers this already which you know, we, we don't need and so if you in, if you look at this data and you're convinced that you can lose this index you can actually run this statement right here and get rid of the redundant index and you can see now it's gone there's a couple of more cases of um, redundant indexes. Let's say we take a slightly, you know, slightly modified example. We have again uh, same table, except now we have one, you know, normal index and one unique index. So right now, you know, in the previous example, we saw that index one was redundant, uh, index two was redundant because it was already covered by index one. Right now, it's completely the other way around because index two is a unique one. You don't want to use, you don't want to lose the uniqueness characteristic if you kind of trim on the indexes. So, if we run the review now, you will see that right now it says that index one is redundant because it's covered by index two, which is now the redundant one. So you can see that it picks, you know, the right one. It doesn't just, you know, look for columns. It just actually picks the right one depending on uniqueness. There's more cases of redundant indexes. For example, if you have a primary and a unique. So right now we have, again, the same table. One index is unique and the other one is primary key. So obviously one of them is, you know, is not needed. And you will see that it defers to the primary key. It, it thinks that the primary key is more important than the unique key, which is, you know, which is sensible. Finally, we get to composite keys. So right now we have index one over ID and over column A, and just index two over just ID. So because the indexes in MySQL are B trees, index two is actually redundant because uh, in, for any query that could use index two, you could already use index one. And there are there's a larger set of queries that could use index one. So if we now run the view, you will see that it correctly suggests to remove only um, index two because you know it covers less cases than index one. So there's a couple of more um, views 
uh, about uh, indexes in common schema. Um, we're in this particular redundant keys uh, view only is looking at just indexes, but um, there's a special case when you want to, you know, not just consider uniqueness, but also if the columns are nullable, because then you could have a case where a uni unique um, uh, index could be could actually used as a primary key. Well, for those cases, we have the candidate keys uh, view, which looks for all the uh, unique indexes which are not nullable, and it will, you know, suggest, uh, it will show you that those, those are all actually, in fact, candidate keys. And then there's a, a candidate keys recommended view, which will suggest you should, you know, use either one of them as the primary key. So these are all utilities you can use. Uh, Shlomi created all these things uh, from his consulting background, so he enters customers and finds databases and database schemas and you know whatever could be the case with those things, and he uses these utilities to very quickly identify if you know if, if customers maybe created too many uh, indexes and if they uh, maybe could you know lose indexes to improve write performance or whatever. Okay. Yeah, another case he seems to run in a lot is. Um, uh, finding uh, instances of tables, you know, DB tables without a primary key. Um, the reason why this is a specific case for him is that um, the InnoDB will create a primary key under the covers if you don't create one explicitly. So by quickly identifying those uh, tables who, who do not have explicit primary keys, uh, you can probably improve the schema by, you know, adding one yourself. And to do this, you just simply select from the no underscore PK underscore InnoDB tables um, a few to identify those tables who do not have an explicit primary key definition. Here's another part I contributed: uh, dependency routines. Uh, if you're used to Oracle or you know uh, Microsoft SQL Server, then you might notice that if you create a view or you create a stored procedure, then you can use the metadata schema or the system tables to see which objects are used by which other objects. You can track dependencies. So you could, for example, see which, which tables are used by a view, or if you have a store procedure, which tables or columns are used in, in that. Or which routines are, you know, depending on other routines. MySQL sadly does not have this feature, and although this is not a complete solution, we at least now have something to quickly, quickly find out uh, what a particular view is using. So, for example, now I'm using, I'm looking at the Sequila schema. I'm look at, looking at the actor info view, and this get view dependencies routine quickly, you know, finds out that we're using all these different tables inside inside that view, and this might help you to, you know, when you're optimizing the schema or if you want to track down uh, and find, you know, if if a particular view is performing badly because of some table. Uh, which is performing badly, you can at least quickly identify if this view or table is used in, in another view. Similarly, if you have routines, a routine could call another routine, and to figure that information out, you can run the get routine dependencies. And we have the, sim uh, the same ones for, for, for events, and um, uh, I think for triggers, I, I should check. But here you can see that the um, Rewards report stored routine in Secular Schema is using customer payment, it's selecting from those, and it's also creating a temporary table uh, which is created, dropped, inserted into, and selected from, all in this, this one procedure. Um, if um, the routine, the, the, if the rewards report would be calling routines itself, it would also see those, you know, those dependencies in this, in this particular view. Uh, what this thing does not do currently is it does not track recursive dependencies. So if a procedure is calling another procedure, it will not, you know, recursively go down and find the dependencies inside that 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 called procedure. But it's a, it's a start. So apart from. Um, uh, th these are typical DBA tools. Everything we saw right now, the uh, schema, you know, schema object analysis, 
dependencies, indexes, all that stuff is DBA stuff. There's also a few uh, items in the common schema which might be uh, of interest to developers. Uh, MySQL, of course, has a nice set of um, uh, built-in functions, but still, uh, you, can, you can do better, or at least you can improve uh, in, in a couple of cases. So here's a bunch of uh, date and time uh, functions. We've got start of hour, start of week, um, start of week in case you want a week to start on Sundays, start of month, start of quarter, and so on. And there's also an Easter day uh, uh, function, which might be useful, you know, if you want to, well, it, it sounds strange to have this, this thing in the, inside a uh, database function library, but Easter day, when you have Easter day, you can cal calculate a lot of the Christian holidays, which is important for planning the applications and that, that kind of thing. And so this is a, a nice, you know, nice feature to, to have. But these are all like um, application developer type of tools. There's also some text uh, functions, uh, something to, you know, to do the tokenization. Um, and there's a bunch of utilities to make it easier to do dynamic SQL. Everybody that has used dynamic SQL inside MySQL procedures knows that you have a, a you know, three-way process. You have to prepare the query, then you have to execute it one or multiple times. And then you have to throw away the statement handle. And in many cases, this sequence of these three statements occurs you know, a lot in, this, in these store procedures. To make it easier, um, this is all bunched up in a, in a single procedure, exact single, which you can just you know, run. So you can just simply do call common schema dot exact single. And you push dynamic SQL in there and execute it in one go without having to first prepare and then execute and then clean up. That, that, that this thing does it all in one. And you can also do it with multiple statements. So you can you know push a whole bunch in them if you separate them by a, by a semicolon and just use the exec and then have you know have a, a whole script executing dynamically. These. I, by, by themselves, these these, these might not seem very useful, but you will see the use uh, later on in scripting because uh, Common Schema also uh, provides scripting capabilities. Well, I mean, everybody you know probably has done some Bash or some some Pro scripting, but uh, Common Schema adds a whole new dimension to this in that you can do this all from inside the database. And it's not so much that we like stuff being in the database; it's just that it's more convenient. If you want to have a toolkit, you know you don't have to have all these dependencies. So that's the reason to to want this, to to build scripting support inside the database. Here's a few examples. Um, let's say we're using uh, the test database. So there's just one table inside. We we don't care, you know, a lot about that right now. And let's say we want to copy the entire secular database to the test schema. So what we're doing here is we're calling eval, and eval takes a dynamic SQL query, and it, it expects that SQL query to, to generate new statements, which will then be executed you know, one by one by one by one by eval. So in this particular case, the, the statement we stick inside, eval, will generate DDL statements to create you know, new tables. And we, we select those tables from the Sequila schema by using information schema dot, uh, dot tables. So we get all the tables from the Sequila schema and generate one create table test dot table name as select from the Sequila source schema uh, for them. So if we run this one, it's going to take a little while. And now we do, you know, we're still in the test schema. So you can see that it has just simply copied all those tables in there with just one command. And we can, it's not confined to just DDL, we can, you know, we can count it too. So if we run essentially the same thing now, but instead of generating a DDL query, we're now selecting a, uh, you know, a count star for each. We can quickly count what's inside the, the, the test schema we just built. 
you can see we just now generated you know a whole bunch of select count star from all these tables with again just one single one single command. So once we're done playing with that, we can also drop you know uh, drop the, the tables inside the test schema. Obviously, you want to be careful that you're dropping them from the right you know, from the right schema. But at least it's now possible to do this with a fairly clean and simple fairly clean and simple utility. You can use um, uh, Eval2 for other stuff. If you're not so much interested in copying databases, you can also use it, for example, to, well, suppose you want to clear the system up and you know, kill lots of connections. Here's another example, which will you know, look at the process list, get all the current connections, and generate a kill statement for each one of them, except, well, this is actually wrong, except our own connection. So right now I don't have any, let me see. Yeah, I have two connections right now. And I am currently one. So if I'm gonna run this screen right here, it's gonna kill everybody except me. If we look now here, then you know this was our other, this was connection ID two. Um, you can see that this one was actually killed. It lost the connection because the other session killed it using this, this single eval statement. So eval is you know very useful, but it's a little bit clunky because we have to put in the dynamic SQL statement and we have to you know mess with a lot of quotes to make the statements work. And in order to make those things easier. Um, there's a there's a for each utility, and for each is a very a very versatile thing. Um, you can for each works like this. You can run for each on a range or on some collection of things, and the collection could be a range, or it could also be a query, or it could also be some some specialized syntax. What I'm going to show later on. And the nice thing about this is that instead of actually generating the statements uh, by string concatenation, what we did with eval, you can use a, a, a very simple scripting language to, to make it all easier. So here's an example. I'm calling I'm calling com, com schema dot dollar, and the dollar is simply an alias for um, um, for 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 each, just to make it you know faster and less verbose to type it in. In this particular example, the range or the collection is a static range from one to three, and we're generating a select statement, and we can refer to the current item in the collection right here using this dollar syntax. So it's positional syntax. The dollar one means it's like the first uh, column in the in the range. Yes. Can you union the other point and do uh, one result set? Um, from right now, you can't. It will just simply execute all those statements as one statement, and that will be the output. So this was a simple range from one to three, but we can do it a little bit more fancy. We can use nested ranges. So if I'm going to run this right here, you can see we now have a range of static range from 1 to 2 and inside the 1 to 2 range we're going to have another range from 5 to 6 so it's a very short, short range but it's just so we can see the output and notice it and we can now see that the statement we're generating refers to dollar $1 and dollar $2 so obviously the, the dollar $1 is the current item of the first range and the dollar $2 is the uh, current item of the second range so if I'm going to run this we can see that here, it's iterating over the first item of the first setting range, static range. And here, it's seeing the second item of this, this, the first sec, uh, static range. And here, it's going over 5 and 6, 5 and 6. So it's a nested, a nested loop. We can make this nested loop infinitely long. We can you know, add more and more and more items if we want to. Maybe slightly more useful than just using uh, separate uh, uh, ranges. 
we can. Um, well, I'm first going to. Seems it's taken quite long, 0.5 per second. Yes, it's true. It's uh, it's stored procedures, and it's it's uh, it, it has the inherent slowness of, of that. Um, maybe there are ways to improve the performance. We really didn't look at it right now. Uh, the main motivation right now was just just to get something that simply works. It's 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 mainly used as an administration tool to well to to quickly enter a batch uh, operation. And the assumption is that usually you're going to use this to copy tables. Uh, Things that take long anyway, so that the scripting overhead is, is going to be, you know, not that huge. It's probably not a good idea to, you know, build your new web server using this scripting language. That, that's not the idea. The idea is just to make it easier, uh, not so much faster. But obviously, if performance is a problem, uh, we are, you know, happy to take issues and fix them. I mean, this this is very powerful when you have hundreds of tables with hundreds of tables. Hundreds of databases, hundreds of tables. Absolutely, yes. So I think for every iteration, it takes, say you have 100 databases with 100 tables, that's 10,000 objects. That's 0.5%. Yeah, true. Yeah, true. True. Well, I, I, frankly, I didn't look much at the code right now, so I don't know what's what's making it slow and if it's just my machine or maybe the code itself. But, um, you know, uh, we. We're happy to look at it if, if you if you find some issue with it. Yeah. So. I'm I'm just going to quickly uh, throw away the the data in the test database. Okay, it's already done. That's great. So let's go. Um, I just demonstrated static ranges using the for each utility. We can also use a query instead of um, a static range. So right now what we're doing is we're calling for each, and the collection is now not a static range, but a, you know, a result set. And again, we generate new DDL statements, and we can refer to the columns of the result set using positional syntax. So right, right now, the one here refers to the first column in the result set. So here we're going to create uh, tables in the test database um, for each value inside the scalar category uh, table. So I'm going to run this one. Then you see it has created one table in, in the test database for each you know, row in the circular category table. Obviously, the, the, the use case is bogus right now, but this is, you know, you, you could use these these utilities to, to, to play around and create tables on the fly and maybe you know use it to you could you, you could run a, a query on the information schema the columns uh, table to vertically partition the table or whatever those 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 things that, that's what what it's, what it's built for finally um, instead of uh, using a plain query um, uh, usually these queries well, can get pretty verbose and in many cases you simply need to uh, do something for each table inside a schema or uh, do something for every schema, those kinds of things. So there's a, a separate syntax to do that. So this one right here, table in test, this is special syntax which will be recognized as for each table in the test schema. And now we're you know, generating a new drop statement. So now we're going to clean up the test database by simply dropping all the, all the tables inside. So the scripting doesn't really stop here. We still have a run and a run file uh, utility. Shlomo was working on that. If you look at the help for it, um, And you'll notice that he's created a, an entire scripting language um, which allows you to do stuff like this. I don't think the syntax for this entire thing is documented yet, but the idea is to have a, you know, a more or less reasonable scripting language inside, inside the database. 
uh, with, with a little bit more possibilities than just 4H and uh, eval. So um, I think the idea is now uh, um, for him to just release this and you know wait if other people find this useful, and if so, he's going to you know expand it and create more of it, and if not, you know probably he's going to just use it for himself. But um, these are you know developments that are ongoing right now, and uh, you know I would invite everybody to that you know that 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 seems to have a need for this to simply install it and try it out. Uh, as I showed, it's very easy to just download it and just run the script. Uh, you know, run it obviously on a, on, a, on a test database and just play around with it. If you, you know, if you like it a lot or if you if you hate it, you can blog about it and let uh, let you know let the world know. And of course, there's a you know on the Google Code Project there's an issues list where you can you know uh, tell us what you think and tell us what you like and tell us what you don't like. Uh, so uh, so uh, uh, work can be done. Of course, if you have some utilities yourself which you think you know might be useful inside this common schema. Then uh, you know, Shlomo is very accessible. Is very open to all kinds of contributions. So, if you would like to see your stuff in the common schema and you know have the rest of the world use it, uh, please you know uh, uh, drop us a line at the, at the project, and uh, uh, well, we'll be happy to look at it and uh, you know add it to common schema. Um, this basically concludes my presentation. I, I I'm happy to answer questions, uh, but these are the examples I wanted to show you and to uh, to let you know. Yes? Um, question about the uh, dependencies. Yes? Um, there was one method called get SQL dependencies. Yes. Um, I don't know if you didn't show any examples of what that is. All the, um, the get view dependencies and get event dependencies and routine dependencies, they're based on a, a single generic uh, procedure, the get SQL dependencies. Um, let me look for the syntax for that. Um, But you can uh, basically run and uh, uh, run dependencies in an arbitrary SQL statement. So uh, yeah. So so here's here's how it works. So suppose um, you would have just a source for a view, then you can run this thing, and without uh, oh, uh, I have to have common schema, of course. But you, this will just simply parse the uh, parse the SQL and get the dependencies for that particular SQL statement. The other way, the other way around. Yeah, we're working on that. It's a feature request, and um, we we're thinking about uh, an efficient way to, to to do this because the other way around is uh, considerably more complicated because you have to take a list of all the things that are there, and then figure out if they are being used by another thing. Um, the, uh, the there are some ideas to do it. So if you if you like to see this feature, then you know please. Uh, um, add your comment to the to the feature request so we know that it's wanted, because it, it takes a lot of time to build this. We we'd love to do it, but um, uh, it would be great to know that there's somebody out there that actually needs it, needs it and can test it for us once we're done, you know, coding it. So, yeah, good question. Yes. Um, actually, two questions, and um, I was delayed a little bit, so I didn't That's get okay. until about five minutes in, but. Um, do you see any limitations with calling uh, common schema from stored procedures, especially the ones that do DML? Yeah. I'm sorry, DDL. That's a good question. One of the, the question is, um, would it, what what are limitations if you would start calling uh, the common schema routines from inside another stored routine, and especially if you would use common schema to run uh, DDL? Um, Frankly, uh, I've been tempted, but not uh, not yet. Uh, you know, haven't found the time to actually uh, run tests on running. You know, using common schema for each to call for each to call for each, and just to see how that goes. Um, it's MySQL, so it's it's it's. I mean, and we're using dynamic SQL, and those are things that, in the past at least, used to be, you know, could be flaky and could have memory issues. Uh, so there's definitely. Uh, 
you should definitely be cautious and if you want to run those things in the production database, you should probably try these things beforehand on your own system and uh, ascertain that it's safe. But currently we don't really know what's safe and what the limitations are because we haven't you know, uh, pushed the limits of it yet. But um, um, right now there are no logical limitations, but since it's MySQL and there could be bugs, you know, it, it, uh, there, you, you should be wary of, of it, yeah, so. so. Okay, thanks. Can I ask a second? Absolutely. Um, I run a lot of systems in Amazon RDS and hope to do so in the HP new cloud yes. database solutions. Um, is there a way to get this on those? I would think that the installation process would not work with, uh, with things like RDS and HP's. I, yeah. I don't know what they're calling it at the moment. I believe RDS does not let you have super privilege. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Then, then that that's basically uh, that basically means that it, you won't be able to run it as it is now. There might be some parts that you can run. Uh, for example, you probably should be able to uh, to get the SQL dependencies thing running. But uh, to in order to uh, to run dependencies on views and sub procedures, we need access to the MySQL database. The reason is that. The information schema uh, tables also give you access to the code of views and sort of procedures, but there's some bugs, unfortunately, in the in the escaping of the code, which uh, you know, we, we really didn't want to do that, but that seems to be the only sensible way to actually make this work. So, to cut a long answer short, probably not. It's probably not something that you can easily run on RDS right now. On the other hand, uh, if you would, you know, if you if you want to make it work there, um, and you find some issues. And you, you know, you, you, you feel that it might be worth investing some time in it. Then maybe you can point us to the things that are not working, and we can look into it and maybe try and make it work. So that that's something that. But today, probably not. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, is there any more questions? So if you if you want to ask some more questions, you know, after the session, out of line, then feel free to just contact me. I'll I'll be around for a bit more. So, thank you.